Our next uh, next speaker uh, of the session is Michael Cobb uh, from the University of Stockholm, and uh, he's going to talk about non classicality of scalar field dark matter. So, Michael, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this um, subject, which um, is of my kind of uh, core interest in the in the past uh, in the past year. And I've been working on um, this question with um, Vasilis um, Frankos and Igor Pikowski at Stockholm University, and also with Andrew Eberhardt and Tom Abel at um, Stanford University. And so the, the two main, res uh, main results um, you can find in these two um, publications. So what is it about? Um, dark matter is a pillar of, of cosmology, but yet we know so little about it that it is still a possibility that dark matter could be made of a light scalar field, a light bosonic particle. And if the de Broglie wavelength is large enough or the mass of this particle small enough, um, larger than the interparticle distance, the mean interparticle distance, then this type of dark matter is usually described by a classical field rather than by a collection of particles. And it's very interesting to ponder um, if this classical field description is the right one, given that from the particle perspective, it's a very quantum mechanical uh, state. If the de Broglie wavelength is much larger than the interparticle distance, we usually have in mind that something quantum mechanical is going on. And the, the most immediate approach um, for us was to actually start with what everyone is usually assuming, which is the classical field description, and see if just looking around this description, if we can identify quantum phenomena. And um, the most um, immediate uh, result we got was um, that there is one related to uh, what is known in quantum optics and also in the context of Bose condensates squeezing. So the quantum state turned um, into a squeeze state and the time scale at which this happens is extremely short. So for the QCD axiom, which is one major candidate of these kind of light bosonic particles, which in the rest of the talk, I will then therefore call axion-like particles. Um, so for, for, the, for the QCD axiom, this time scale is tiny. It's like um, a few hundred, um, around 100 microseconds. And so it's a, it's a surprisingly short time scale for a quantum phenomenon to arise, especially given that usually people assume it is a classical phenomenon. Um, and I will explain what quantum squeezing is in case you don't know. The second time scale happens well after that, that we at least identified. At this time, which we call the classical breakdown, the classical field description itself breaks down. And this is proportional to the time scale at which um, gravitational collapse forms bound objects. And it's um, boosted by the occupation number. Um, even though this occupation number is very large because there's a lock, actually the, this time scale is still within the kind of, it's much shorter than the age of the universe and therefore could be relevant. So this is kind of the take home message I want to get across first before I go into the uh, details. So why, why would you be interested in this question? Um, here you see a snapshot or two snapshots of a cosmological simulation showing you the cosmic web formed by the um, gravitational attraction of dark matter. On the right, you see how it looks like for the standard cold dark matter particle, a classical particle. And on the left, it's the, um, the classical field description that you would expect for axion-like particles, or, which is usually assumed. And now you might ask, are there any other circumstances where we have kind of verified that this classical field description is the right one? Um, and here, sorry, as a zoom, zoom in, if you can't see these differences here, there are some fringes at these filaments you can better see in this um, zoomed in picture. And those are, those are features people look for in observations to maybe identify if dark matter is a light scalar field or not. And the other um, situation where we know this description is, is valid is in the context of Bose condensates where we pull down normal matter so that, that the Broglie wavelength um, becomes very large 
and this field description becomes valid. But it's very tricky to actually um, cool it down and keep it in the state where you can see the interference pattern. So if you compare the time scales where it has been done in the lab mi milliseconds and millimeters compared to the cosmological time scales, it's quite surprising that this should be valid on these large scales and long time scales. Um, another argument for why you should be suspicious about this um, classical field description is how it's usually argued for. So um, the non-relativistic quantum n body um, problem has two formulations that those are mathematically completely equivalent. One is called non-relativistic quantum field theory. The other one um, I call quantum n body problem. Quantum n body problem looks like textbook quantum mechanics. You have n particles, each has their own um, position and momentum operator. These are the Heisenberg equations. The maybe less well-known but equivalent formulation is the um, field, uh, it's a field theory, but it's completely equivalent. And um, in this case, the, um, the whole dynamics is encapsulated by this uh, Heisenberg equation for the quantum field. And now you can do the kind of hand wavy classical limit, which is you turn um, commutation relations into Poisson brackets. This produces you the standard Newtonian um, particle trajectories um, in this formulation, or it produces you the um, gauss pitayevsky equation in this formulation. Now you have two classical limits and um, the hand wavy argument to decide which of those should apply is whether the de Broglie wavelength is much smaller or much larger than the interparticle distance. And then you also see differences ex exactly below this de Broglie wavelength scale. So this is the usual um, kind of argument and wavy, but convincing, I guess. Um, yet there are some people discussing whether there's actually anything quantum mechanical or not going on. Um, and there's some superficial way of discussing it. And I think the more deeper ways um, are collected in, in some of these um, papers. And so it's clear there are some, there are some things that need to be clarified. And so what we did was, I think the, the most kind of conservative um, approach. We actually assume the gauss pitayevsky equation to be valid and ask, can there still be on top of that quantum effects? So instead of just doing the hand wavy turning Poisson brackets, uh, sorry, turning commutation relations into Poisson brackets, we instead enforce this uh, gauss pitayevsky equation by choosing a, an ansatz for the quantum field which is called the Hartree ansatz and a specific initial condition, which is which we pick to be a coherent state. Both are very harmless and conservative. Um, if you plug in this ansatz, you get the gauss pitayevsky equation for sure, which in a cosmological context looks like this. So these equations have been solved to produce the simulations I showed you earlier. But on top of that, you also get an equation for the field operator that actually creates particles in the gauss pitayevsky mode. And the equation of motion um, is known as the Kerr nonlinear oscillator equation. And you have um, for this, um, in front of the, um, these um, linear and cubic terms of the um, gauss pitayevsky mode operator, um, two coefficients, omega and chi, and those are completely determined by the solution of the gauss pitayevsky equation. So knowing basically what the solution, um, I don't know if I still there, yes. So knowing what the um, solution to these equations, uh, to this equation is, you can determine these parameters. And um, the interpretation is that this is related to kinetic energy and this is related to gravitational potential energy. And you can work out what these co coefficients are. They are um, related to the um, axion-like particle mass and its um, root mean velocity squared, which is about 10 to the minus six um, of the speed of light. This A is the scale factor of the universe. Um, you don't need to worry about this. Um, so what are the properties of this nonlinear oscillator equation? Um, Interestingly, if you plug in as an initial condition, the coherent state, it doesn't stay a coherent state. So here I show you a phase-based picture of the coherent state and you see it deforms into a squeezed state. 
what is a squeeze state? You can construct it from the vacuum state by applying a squeezing and a displacement operator. Unfortunately, I'm running off time, so I won't explain to you what oh, squeezing minutes, actually. So. Yeah, <laughs> what, sque what squeezing actually is. Um, it's a deformation of the coherent state that in phase space literally looks like you are squeezing it in one direction. And interestingly, if you have the squeezing, um, you cannot describe it in any way classically. That's why we thought it's a nice result because it immediately produces you something non-classical despite the validity of the gross pedevsky equation. Um, now we worked out what's the time scale. I don't go through the details because I'm running out of time. And I already showed you this main result, which is the kind of 100 microsecond scale where squeezing starts to manifest. And then there's also a time scale where it's getting really big. And if you are familiar with inflation, um, these kind of monstrous values of squeezing um, are also occurring um, during inflation when the um, vacuum fluctuations get amplified. Um, in any case, none of these results would have been obtained if we made the standard assumption that this operator is a C number. So it all depends on treating it within quantum physics consistently. Um, to conclude, we have shown that the gross pedevsky equation is incomplete and is accompanied by this care oscillator equation, which produces squeezing out of an initially coherent state. This is a witness of non-classicality, and it happens on these very short time scales. And crucially, it's independent of the occupation number. Usually, occupation numbers are invo invoked to argue for classicality. Um, Open questions are if the squeezing can be observed and what decoherence might do to the squeezed states. We are working on this at the moment. Um, in addition, we also worked on actually um, going beyond the gross pedevsky equation with colleagues in, in Stanford, especially Andrew Eberhardt, the PhD student there. He worked out corrections to the gross pedevsky equation and derived this new time scale um, at which the um, gross pedevsky equation breaks down. And I'm also working on other um, related um, modifications of the gross pedevsky at the moment. Um, that's it. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Michael. All right. Please, uh, questions. I have uh, Albert. Albert, go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, thank you for the talk. So this remind me uh, quite a bit about what is known in the field of Boseanian Einstein condensation as. Uh, condensate depletion. Uh, but in any case, uh, so what I was thinking is that at least in, in that case, it's more that uh, you see that um, when you, you have the mean field description that you, you know, uh, corresponding to the gross pedevsky equation, but when you then look at the quantum fluctuations there, that for the interacting theory, so to speak, uh, you should already consider this squeeze state. So I guess that maybe in those contexts is more natural of, it's a bit like thinking of what's the vacuum of an interacting theory, the dress mm -hmm. vacuum, so to speak, rather than what you were describing it sounds a bit more like as if you were considering uh, yes. the, 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 the ground state for the free theory, but you have an interacting theory. And then in a very short time scale, you see how it gets dressed, so to speak. Uh, but uh, maybe a different way of thinking about it is that you just somehow naturally generate the dress state, so to speak, to begin with. Um, I think what you said might be um, covered in this um, review by Parkins and Walls um, on Bose-Einstein condensate, where they worked out basically the ground state for an interacting theory of this form. Right. And they right. they show they have shown that it is a squeezed state. Right. But this result is not well known, um, at least in the cosmology community. But um, so I'm sure um, there might be uh, already um, people who have worked on similar questions in the BEC context, and it's just very tricky to 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 find these connections. Mm -hmm. But would you agree that maybe it might be hard to really describe in detail, but it's maybe more physically closer to reality that instead of having this squeezing in a very short time scale, that when you generate in a cosmological model these things, they kind of naturally arise in this manner, you know, in this sort mm -hmm. of dress state uh, for this interacting theory. Yeah, I mean, the the time scale is an 
in some sense, an artifact of a bunch of assumptions that we made, like we start mm -hmm. initially in a coherent state and we, we assume this, um, that mm -hmm. only the, the Gross-Pedayevsky mode is occupied. So there's no depletion whatsoever. There's no Bogol so the other mode is well, yes. mm -hmm. And in, in, in this case, the squeezing happens on the short time scale. If you play around with these assumptions, you might find something else. Um, and in particular, it's natural to assume, given that the squeezing happens so quickly, that maybe it's already there to start with, rather than starting with a coherent state. The coherent state initial condition was really just chosen to be as conservative as possible, because this is what usually people have in mind when they think of um, a field configuration is classical. Then the quantum state associated with this is a coherent state. All right. Uh, so if there's any follow-ups or further questions, I'm going to ask that we wait until the end of the session. Uh, thank you very much. Please let's uh, thank Michael again. Thank you.